And welcome to everybody. And um, call, please. We would. Joe Pichieri. Here. Um, Josh Aguilar. Here. Okay. Um, Daniel Davidson. Here. Cindy Coza. Here. Jonathan Hayes. Carla Berg. Here. Terry Dillon. Here. Adam Jenkins. Here. Uh, Brett Hansey did um, contact us. He is not able to make it today. And then Eric Adams. Here. Thank you. And did everybody receive a copy of the minutes from last time? Any comments? Um, any input and changes? I have a motion to approve. So motion to approve. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Okay. So business from the Highlands uh, is on the agenda now. Public testimony will be received during business from the Highlands. As a reminder, the meeting is being recorded. The committee will listen to your comments, but will not respond to public comment until the committee responds portion of the meeting agenda. Meeting minutes will be taken by the staff and forwarded to the city manager and city council. Members of the public can always send written testimony to the committee or city council. As we begin our meeting tonight, I would ask members of the virtual audience to please keep yourselves on mute until you are called to provide public testimony. Speakers in person will be allowed to speak first, after which virtual audience members will be allowed not to speak. Public testimony will allow speakers two minutes, each for a total of 20 minutes. If you're joining us online with a tablet, smartphone, or computer and wish to speak, please use the raise hand feature to make the uh, request. You'll be called on when it is your turn to speak. Please identify your name, Springfield board member, and the subject you would like to speak about. People calling in by phone only, you are in listen mode, listen mode, mode only and cannot be called upon. Do we have anybody on public? There are no attendees other than the panelists. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is committee response. Mm -hmm. Anyone would like to share anything? I do have one question. I'm not sure if this is the appropriate time, but um, you can always tell me not. Um, I, I've been going back through the minutes in the past a little bit. There have been some action items that, to my knowledge, were never really addressed. I don't think we've ever taken an action item list and referred to it in the future. I mean, so I'm not sure how we track how these things are being uh, being addressed. I don't know that the it's something we want to talk about if we want to do action items. If we don't, is it necessary? Um, or do we just keep kind of putting it into the back burner area? What kind of examples they have? Well, um, SPD was approved for extra funding for training and ballistic rifle shield from that. I was, I was, uh, we were supposed to receive 200,000. Did that happen? I actually submitted the application for that today. So okay. timely. Um, yes. So I have to say, just as a, comment Tiffany um, is who I am standing in for today and she gave me some some introduction to what recent topics have been discussed and that was actually one of them I think that might have come up recently and so she and I just brainstormed about what had worked in the past and she had noted that occasionally there had been maybe a question from an individual um, member of the committee and that information may have been provided to that member rather than to the member and copied to the entirety of the committee. And that was something that she had made note of, you know, in the future, I'm going to do, I'm going to make sure to do that so that everyone knows that that action item may have been com completed or the intent to address that request had been made. So that was just one of those things that um, she and I happened to discuss in passing, but I think that that would be a valid since um, your committee liaison isn't present today, but if you have recommendations of, of some 
some of that tracking, I'm I'm sure that we would be open to facilitating that. Okay. I had read all the minutes from the last year when we did that summary report, mm -hmm. and I noticed that there were several things that there were there wasn't follow up that I was aware of, like reading minutes. So like if the actions were done, it wasn't in the next minutes, you know. Mm -hmm. And one of them was like my first meeting where I talked about the deaf community and doing some outreach. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing I think might have fallen off the radar, mm -hmm. unless I didn't you know. I wasn't personally followed up with about that. But um, I personally like the idea of having the action items and doing some kind of tracking and follow up. Good. Thank you. I know there's been some emails Tiffany has sent out over the past year or so that has followed up on some things. Like, But I, like you said, it's probably not in the minutes now. Yeah. And then, then uh, we're going to let's see. Tiffany will contact the city attorney about attending the next meeting to, to discuss. And that was the update on the prohibited camping ordinance. Um, and she's here tonight. Yeah. That's perfect. That's why well, she's here. <laughs> but I think that first was brought up last year. Yeah. And so we yeah. made it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it was great. Talking about yeah. some of these things. So we've got two of them covered already. So that's perfect. Um, let's see what was some of the others. Yeah, uh, Chief had advised that it would be good to go over that ordinance and have a presentation. Thank you. <laughs> And um, then Chief had discussed um, a recent homicide that impacted some of our officers and the a peer support program had been talked about. And that's done. We've, we've had that for a while. Yeah, well, several years. Mm -hmm. um, I also did follow up with the Chief and then the community person. I'm not quite sure his title, but advocating for a full translation of Spanish on the non-emergency line that currently is just press zero. Eugene has a full translation. I think Springfield can do that too. Mm -hmm. And I remember that question sure. about, about that as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I knew we had that here, but I it's not in the minutes. And this was a question that was in the minutes last time. So just curious. So is that something that we want to discuss on having Action item list, or well, I think first of all, we need to, at least in my mind, clarify the term action items because action items in most of the plethora of committees and commissions I have are vote items. Things are called call for a vote or a different action item. Right, and I understand. This, and this, this is a little bit of a follow up. Yeah, have, this is, but we can call it follow up. Yeah, yeah follow -up. I, I would say probably term it different so that way people are and that's clear. Fine. That's fine. And then um, I like the idea of if a, if a member has, poses a question to staff, and there's a there's a at least in the world I operate in is that counselors, for example, ask staff, "Hey, I'd like to see this," and staff sometimes takes that as an edict. Now they've been assigned a job, and but typically staff need to look at us as a group and not specific people that have specific powers to assign staff to do certain things because they're curious. Right. And that's, there's a, it's a fine line and it's difficult because staff, again, they have regular jobs and that these committees can represent or can, if allowed to go amok, could actually consume their work just chasing down questions. So I think as committee members have to be very cognizant of what's being asked and if there's, if it's, Time consuming, and and if there's a consensus among the committee that the, the whole basic committee or the majority of the committee are interested in that question, then that would rise to the level of okay, staff. This committee does need the committee needs would like that information right. as a, as opposed to one person being curious. Mm -hmm. and, and that's fine so, too. I I just wanted to get some feedback on what people felt about this and. Right. And if, if everybody was completely satisfied with the information we were getting. Well, it's a good question, but but I think it just, as, as we're operating as a, as a committee, I think it, we need to be very cognizant of of what's being asked, how it's being asked, and if it's... If well, I think, like, when I was reading all the minutes, it was, we were told there was going to be some follow-up, and then there wasn't any record of that follow-up. Right. So I think it's important to, like, track, if, like, we're expecting to hear a follow-up on something, and it could be, like, low priority six months out. Right. Doesn't Should we ask that question, though? Should we ask for the follow-up during the, during the meeting? 
Well, usually, so usually you're, excuse me for interrupting that, but usually a lot of times either the chief or, or whoever is standing in with the chief will say, we'll get back to you. Yeah, right. And that's what happens a lot of times. And that, and that information, I agree, should be put out to the entire committee because someone may not be here today and they ask the next que same question next meeting. Yeah. Right? Yes, sure. So I think that it makes it easier for communications for, for that information to be to be pushed out to everybody right. and that helps everybody because sometimes again people don't hear the question or not here for the question mm -hmm. or may have a follow-up to that question or the answer that they can uh, reply all or just not you know i wouldn't do reply all i would say send it back to that person if it's right as the level of what the committee know then i think we i think we generally do a pretty good job oh well, that, i think most everybody does an excellent job but yeah. that it's just that there's it was a few things that it just caught my eye as I was going by, and I just wondered about it. Thank you. Do you have any comment? <laughs> no, I think for me. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. No, I, I would treat it just like a list of issues that people are concerned about. I just want to make sure we follow, follow up on the issues that people bring up, not necessarily an action. Just to, yeah, and, and, and answering a question is simply what it is most of the time yes. and getting back on an answer. Yes, exactly. Comment from the audience at home. Thank you. Okay. And because I was throwing everything in, I must know agenda. All right. Um, yes, you are. Am I up? up? Though, okay. Yes, it says right here. Right. right. So is it here? Right. Well, hi, everyone. Hi, uh, I'm Mary Bridget Smith, city attorney. And um, Tiffany had asked me uh, a while ago to come and talk about the camping ordinance. So I'm happy just to kind of talk about that a little bit and sort of where it is now and answer any questions that you have. And then if you have any other questions about process or your role or whatever, I'd be happy to chat about those too. I work with the council for their boards, commissions, and committees, the other ones they have at the city. So I've um, been doing that for a while. So I'd be happy to chat about that as well. Thank you. Um, so do you want to talk camping first? Sure. Okay. And it was my understanding, you just wanted a summary of sort of the camping ordinance and sort of how it's, okay. So um, thinking about the camping ordinance, I would say that the first thing that always comes to mind to me is that when we talk about the illegal camping ordinance in Springfield, what we're talking about is illegal camping on public property, which is different than trespass and is not the only time that um, SPD officers come in contact with folks who are unhoused or homeless. So, um, but it is one of the instances where they can. So the example of illegal camping would be if somebody was um, sleeping or had set up sort of a structure to sleep somewhere on publicly owned property, like around city hall or other places. Um, and so what has been happening, obviously, in recent years, as the homeless crisis has gotten worse, and there are more people who are unhoused and people who um, we also could be the term often is chronically unhoused to be folks chronically unsheltered um, that are really uh, dealing with would be distinguished from maybe people who might be couch surfing or sort of staying in a hotel for a few days and then switching to some other um, living arrangement and then maybe on the streets for a little bit and back and forth. So um, in 2018, 2019, there was a court case called uh, Martin v. Boise, which really dealt with the idea of could you criminalize somebody who was sleeping outside in public when they don't have somewhere else to go? And uh, the, that's a Ninth Circuit case. So we here in this area would be held to that case. And what they ruled was that you couldn't do that. It had some restrictions about that, but you could regulate it. So you could say like, People can't be in the park, you know, at nighttime or other rules about people being there. And then there was a subsequent case um, in 20 um, from Grants Pass, kind of similar facts. And so as a result of that, the Oregon legislature passed something called a uh, House Bill that we just referred to as House Bill 3115, which required cities to come up with camping regulations, essentially. So we did that actually a year ago. The um, limit for that was, or the deadline for that was last, um, I believe it was by June 
in June. So the council worked really through, you know, the winter on coming up with regulations about prohibiting and regulating illegal camping in Springfield. And uh, we worked on having um, regulations that were, we tried to be consistent with other communities. So we looked a lot to see what other communities were doing and then what would work for Springfield in terms of, you know, something that's remarkable about Springfield is has two rivers, right, that go through it. And that is something particular about this community and how it has developed over time and how it looks and where people live. Um, you know, it's close to a freeway. It has a parks district as opposed, which is a separate entity, as opposed to like a parks department within the city, which would be like property that you would be regulating, that the city would be regulating and managing. That's the park district does that. So the council over a number of months came up with some regulations and now there's municipal code that has changed from, you know, before it was like, you can't illegally camp on public property. <laughs> there was no other information about it. And then that has changed uh, because the requirements of that law were that the regulations had to be reasonable. And if they're not reasonable, someone could take you to court and say, hey, this was not reasonable and you need to change these regulations. Mm -hmm. So now camping has been defined um, you know, to be less than 24 hours. Um, and there are certain rules about what people could do. For example, you know, no fires, keeping warm um, is an issue, right? Because obviously the weather here is really um, can be quite cold, but there's a tremendous risk with having open fires clearly um, in places where they shouldn't be. Um, erecting structures, blocking sidewalks, those kinds of things are prohibited. And then the other thing that they prohibited were particular areas in town. So residential areas, um, places that are zoned residential, downtown is another area, and then environmentally sensitive areas also have prohibitive camping. <laughs> so we put the, those regulations into effect. You know, honestly, this is not a, a code that the police department uses very often um, because most of the time or often when police get called for things, it's often a trespass situation because it's someone who's on private property. They could be in a parking lot, they could be um, in front of a store or someplace else. That's a whole different set of rules. And a business can have a trespass letter and move forward with trespassing someone from their private property, which is a different situation. Then um, also what had happened in the meantime is that those cases had said to governments, look, you can't tell, you can't cite someone for illegal camping if there are no other shelter options for them. Meaning like you could say, hey, go to the mission tonight or go someplace else. Um, but they went on further to say it, it's, it needs to be a reasonable shelter situation for them. And so it really is fact specific and it's kind of case by case. You know, they, the police department could in, come across somebody who is homeless. They're trying to find a place for them to be that night, but they could have an animal. They could have lots of, you know, a cart with lots of equipment with them. They could be, um, you know, have used illegal drugs. They could have other issues where they couldn't just go to any shelter, mm -hmm. you know, and also could be a gender thing. Sometimes some shelters are um, specific about gender, those kinds of things. And the court was like, look, you have to have a reasonable shelter for them to be able to go to. Well, that's extremely hard to do anywhere um, because shelters can be, you know, I mean, they can be quite specific in what their rules are. Um, and so the court was still like, well, we don't care if they don't have a reasonable shelter to go to, you really can't cite them, meaning you can't charge them with a the crime, even if that crime is only a fine, doesn't involve jail. So we've been a little bit of a holding pattern because the US Supreme Court took that case up this term and we are waiting for a decision which probably will come down, I would say, any time. And that hopefully will give some guidance about what local governments are supposed to do in these situations in terms of camping. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where we are, um, you know, in that process, the um, city reached out to, you know, tried to reach out to folks with lived experience. At that time, Everett was still doing its meals. And so it was a really good place to be able to get in contact with folks and the folks who ran that, um, those meals. Um, we did an online survey. We had a lot, we tried to have a lot of presence in terms of people giving information to uh, the council and coming into city council meetings to try to get an idea of what people are coming or are, are dealing with. But really, I think, um, and I think the police could definitely speak to this, 
business owners are frustrated, you know, really dealing with folks who are around their business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, City Hall has quite a few people who sleep around it, actually. And uh, really, you know, the way the law is now, it's an individual is kind of in a sleeping bag and they're not really causing a problem and aren't erecting a structure or having a fire or anything. Usually they stay and then in the morning they leave. Um, and it generally isn't a problem. Sometimes it will be and they'll be asked to leave. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of where we are in terms of um, trying to regulate camping in the area. It's just a really difficult situation. Yeah, yeah. For everybody involved. Yes, exactly. And the other thing, you know, we always think about is like, I think we have this kind of picture of a homeless person, right? Because you might see somebody often or people at certain places, but you know, there's this sort of spectrum of people who are experiencing homelessness and also at any different time, it's a different experience. Mm -hmm. And so it's a really hard thing to, I think, for the police department to try and regulate and respond to and for the community to deal with. And, you know, there are people like things that you would normally doing in your house, they're doing outside, right? And so that's also, I think, makes it yeah. really challenging because there's this tension between people being able to enjoy their parks or walk down the street or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the case may be. And, um, but you can't ignore the fact we just have lots of folks who don't have a place to go. So what is the community expected to do in that situation just to notify the police? Yeah, I think so. I mean, they could probably speak to that better than I could, but there's definitely a lot of calls that go in, especially to the non-emergency line, I would say. And then I think business owners, that, you know, call the police a lot if they're dealing, especially if they're the kind of same people, you know, or if you got somebody maybe mental illness, experiencing something, some kind of crisis situation, then they can um, address it sort of depending on the situation. And then at City Hall, we have security. And so often, like if I'm working at City Hall and I come across some situation like that, I'll usually go to security first, and then they may reach out to the police depending on the situation. Um, as big a deal, I know it is a big deal for the for business owners. How about individuals? Is it? Do you have much like residential areas? areas? Yeah, thank you. It yes. seems like, and I think um, maybe Lieutenant Crowley could talk to this. What I have learned or heard from people, there's a couple of officers who really focus on or have a more of a connection with the that community and sort of keep tabs on it. There are some neighborhoods where they're just areas where it is easier to camp, you know, where there may be like an undeveloped lot or an empty house or something like that. And people will, so it kind of goes in phases, I guess is how I would describe it. There might be a situation where there's a particular house that people are coming to quite a bit. Neighbors could get upset and call, then they kind of get pushed out and they might move around. Mm -hmm. Also the really kind of tricky part too is, you know, there are areas here that technically aren't in city limits, but they really look like they're in Springfield, you know, and Hayden Bridge and other areas. Those would be regulated by the county. There's other areas by the river that are a little further out. And I think Eric could speak to this, like in Willamette Lane in some areas, they have the park rangers. That depends as well on that situation, but they also have situations they gotta respond to. I think it just depends. It's a really, I mean, but it's challenging for sure. Yeah, yeah. The count for um, the data that we were working off of last year was that there were about 330 people in Springfield who would be considered chronically homeless, like really unsheltered. Um, and then there's, I can't remember the total number of people who are experiencing homelessness in some measure community-wide. Okay. Yeah. And so is homeless the same as living in their car? Um, no, that would be different. So these chronically homeless folks would be completely unsheltered. These would be people you would see with a tent or a sleeping bag in their car. That's a different, that would be in addition to. Okay. And we didn't um, regulate, uh, we talked with um, the CSOs who regulate people, uh, illegal parking essentially. And there are some areas and some people who do park and they're always kind of keeping track of that and how long they're on the street, asking them to move and that kind of thing. Because that's another area that, you know, obviously people are living in their car. Questions? Um, I don't have any questions, but I really appreciate you um, coming and talking to us about this because I've read um, a little bit the the cases and the bill and not being a legal person, I was like just kind of swimming. So I really yeah. appreciate you you uh, putting it into English for us. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Happy anytime. Anytime. So, do you have any other questions for me, or want to talk about anything else? I, I'd be happy to. All right, well, so we'll see what that Supreme Court decision does. I don't know.
<laughs> That's right, exactly. Or you'll get some dry memo from us about what <laughs> it is. So anyway, well, it was good to see you all. You also yeah. Do we have another item for her? Oh, oh, the SPAC committee and the uh, council liaison. Oh, yes. So did you guys have questions about the council liaison? Well, or the committee liaison or how liaison, I guess I should yeah. say. Um, probably two or three years ago, um, I was asked to be the liaison between this committee and the council. And so I've been going most every week, really yes. zooming in every week. And um, it came up that I was wanting to share my responsibilities and asking for volunteers, sure. which I got none. <laughs> but, but so Chief had asked if that was really something that we needed to do yeah. as a committee or, yeah. and I had been under the influence that it was mm -hmm. something. That yeah, I would do. say, uh, hey, Councilor Fischer, you can jump in here. So, and we are actually changing the operating policies about um, boards, commissions, and committees this month, actually. So the council regulates those committees. They're in their operating policies, which they review annually. And this has been an issue, a topic for the council, because they have several committees and they really do deal with different things. So you have SPAC committee and then you'll have like the museum committee or you have the arts commission or you have another Absolutely. planning commission or whatever. Yeah. So it is, it can be challenging to have a set of rules that sort of applies to everybody equally because those groups are all different. Mm -hmm. So um, we rewrote the, that section that, uh, that will go before the council on Monday for a final review. So hopefully that will provide some clarity. And what, what they're trying, what they're, I think the intent is, is that committees have a council liaison, which it would be the counselor who attends the meetings and does that. Then there is a um, staff liaison, who is the person who sort of manages and kind of runs the committee. And then there could be a committee liaison. Those three individuals can work that relationship however they want. They do, um, and that could, the, the committee liaison could be the chair as well. It doesn't need to be a separate person. Some committees are kind of small, so it's hard to do that. There's no requirement that they go to all the council meetings. Um, that said, I think there is some benefit if there's something that pertains to what the committee is really dealing with. For example, this committee, you know, the police department goes to the council for the use of force report in right. April. Like, that's a good one to attend or if there are things on the agenda that really make sense. Um, or it could be as much as even just kind of seeing what's on the agenda and going, and if you're available to go or to report back, but it is certainly not a requirement. It really depends, I think, on what works for the committee okay. and what's beneficial and what would be helpful for this committee to know so they can do their job. That's how I would look at it. And it can change over time, you know, how people, how people want to deal with it. I mean, I think it's really great, but it's not necessary for people to attend all the meetings for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So really something I think when the committees start, like in the beginning of the year, it's a good opportunity for those three people to talk about, hey, are we going to do this? And then the other thing to remember is, you know, these meetings are subject to public meetings laws, right? right. So they're recorded, you're doing minutes. But if those three people want to talk about like things to put on the agenda or administrative things, like how are we going to do this or who's going to go to the council meeting or how that doesn't need to be in a public meeting setting. You can do that administrative conversation by email or offline, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, Thank because you. otherwise, you know, you'll spend all your time here doing that and then you won't be able to do anything else. So, Thanks. yes, so feel free to do that. Clarification. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Yeah, no, I, I concur. I don't see the need for you to have to be present at any of the count, all the council meetings. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think everybody here should get used to going online to see what's on the council agenda mm -hmm. and to see if there's something that might be of interest and voluntarily just go ahead and go and I'm the last few meetings, right. Chief yeah. and, and some of his people have been right. yeah, presented. Right. So that was, I was very happy to be able to see that. Right. Yeah. And we have, we typically just about the only committee or commission that has people present, generally speaking, most all the time is the planning commission. Mm -hmm. And the planning commission, um, typically there'll be one member that, that sits in on the council meetings. Um, it's not, not like have to be 100% of the time, but mm -hmm. most of the time, because most of the council meetings we're doing are probably land use issues. Mm -hmm. So it's good for them to, to bring that back to the, to the mm -hmm. planning commission. but. As far as the historic commission, the the museum, the arts, the 
trees, the daisies, all that stuff. <laughs> I mean, there's a ton of them, mm -hmm. and the, that room would half fill with if there was one person from each of those committees, that room would be half full every Monday. Yeah, yeah. And there's just no, there's no benefit from that. I don't see. But everybody, if there are committees, at least the staff should watch to see where there is uh, an item that may interest the committee members and maybe push that out by way of email to their committee to see, hey, just FYI, they're, they're doing this on Monday mm -hmm. and let people decide whether they're going to do that. And that, that may be very helpful for yeah. um, the yeah. committees. But yeah. don't worry. I don't know who told us that. It wasn't me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you again. Yep. Appreciate it. No problem. Anytime. If you think of other questions, just let Jessica or Tiffany know. We would give you a chance. Okay. All right, see you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. See you tomorrow. Yep. See you tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Business from. Uh, uh, first of all, I wanted to thank Mary Richard for stopping by today. Yeah. She. Uh, oh, thank you. She's my go-to for a lot of questions. Uh -huh. um, I think the easy answer for an attorney when the cops are calling asking questions is it depends. <laughs> Um, I don't get the easy or answer. No. Or no. I, I'm okay with no. Uh, it, the easy answer is it depends. I always get a clear answer. Thank you, Bridget. And it's always uh, important stuff. I try not to bugger with non important things. I really appreciate you coming by. She's a great resource for us at okay. BB and the city as a whole. All right. See you guys. Bye bye. Bye, Gary B. Um, business from SPD. I jotted down a lot of notes here. Um, I'll be quick with it. Some of them are probably more important to one person or another in the committee or myself or Jessica. So I'll, I'll kind of breeze through it and touch on stuff and then uh, we'll see what comes of it. Um, several things staffing wise have changed recently. We've had a promotion. Uh, Sergeant Justin Myers became a Lieutenant uh, effective uh, this past Sunday. Um, so with that, uh, Sergeant Kirkpatrick who was acting Lieutenant moved to a position where he's a administrative slash training sergeant slash dispatch supervisor. He's, he's wearing three hats. Uh, he'll be taking on that task. Uh, sergeant Kyle Potter moved to the professional standards division. So he'll be doing a lot of the internal affairs, professional standards, hiring, backgrounds, uh, job postings, use of force reports, um, anything you can think of behind the scenes. Uh, Kyle's going to have his hands full with that. So it's going to be our responsibility to make sure he's supported uh, on that to get those tasks done. Uh, Dylan Korth recently uh, got himself a motorcycle. He finished motorcycle school, and he's uh, our newest motorcycle officer. He's uh, he's, a, he's excited. He's a, he's a fun guy. Um, he's not Ponch or John, but he still do. For those of you who are old enough to remember Ponch and John, uh, he's he's a really great guy. Uh, we hired a new police officer this week, uh, Dylan French. Uh, he's a lateral police officer from Arizona, who's originally from the Eugene Springfield area. Um, went down there, worked for a few years, and decided he wanted to come back home. And this is where he's at. So he's in his training week, along with two new detention officers, Jesus Cisneros and Colin Mastrian. If you're watching, Colin, I apologize if I didn't say your name right. Um, they're uh, both uh, detention officers starting at the jail. They're in their training phase this week as well, reading policies and procedures and uh, getting various uh, boxes checked before they can officially start their job. Uh, Tammy Duvall recently started in records. Uh, she's been about a couple of weeks now. Um, so we have a lot of new faces, a lot of changes happening, a lot of new assignments happening. Um, on a slightly sad side, if you hadn't already heard, uh, canine Griff passed away, uh, recently, uh, he was diagnosed with some, can a lot of cancer issues and, uh, our, our folks right now across the street from us here took care of him and, uh, his handler, uh, officer Garcia Cash is doing well. As you can imagine, it's a really traumatic thing for a, a handler to lose uh, their partner, their canine partner, and he's handled it well. Um, staff's reached out to him, uh, peer support's reached out to him, uh, and his friends have reached out to him, and he's got a pretty good support system set up, so I wanted to share and acknowledge that. Uh, the upside of the canine picture is coming up in next Saturday, 15th, is the canine competition. Um, it's not going to be a silky field this year, so don't show up there. They're redoing the field, put turf out there. So we moved over to the Hamlin Sports Complex uh, where the baseball field is, and we're going to be doing some uh, accounting competition there. It's going to be uh, a little bit different setting, uh, a lot of fun um, on turf instead of grass for a change. So that'll be a little bit different for the dogs. There'll be uh, handlers from all over the state coming here. 
and we've hosted this for a long time and it's just a, a highlight of our department uh, every year to be able to host this and, and showcase our Will relationship be back next year or what is this going to be a permanent move I, I have no idea if it'll be permanent or not i think we'll see how this goes i think it just opens the door for a little competition maybe somebody wants it this year maybe next year we maybe we go back and forth and it kind of makes everybody happy so too soon to say on that one. um some other thing olympic trials uh coming up pretty soon i'm working with uh University of Oregon Police Department, Eugene Police Department on planning for that. The big Springfield component for that is on the 29th of June, early morning. We're hosting the 20 kilometer race walk downtown. Uh, for those of you who are around in 21 uh, to see the race walk, it is on 5th Street and Main Street. It is an L shaped lap that's done 20 times. It goes from 5th uh, and Main up to 5th and C, back to 5th and Main, and then down to Pioneer Parkway, East and Main and back. And it is a really entertaining sport to watch. If you want to get up at 7.30 in the morning on the 29th, uh, it was scheduled for later in the day. Last time we hosted this, and it was ridiculously hot, and it was not safe for the athletes. Um, so they bumped it up to an early morning start, and we still got a great response from the community. It's internationally televised, um, so it's a it's a fun event to host, but uh, it's, it's nice and cool in the morning still, so there will probably be some uh, Great opportunities for meet and greets with various community members, counselors, be a handful of cops out there. Uh, should be a fun time. It's always fun for us to do those things. So fun community event. Um, measure 110, I'm sure is always in your radar. A um, lot of changes still happening with the revamp of that measure. And as recently as this morning, this morning, uh, new Lieutenant Justin Myers attended a meeting. It's we are meeting with other law enforcement agencies as well as the district attorney's office on the um, deflection process. It's a new word I have to keep. I want to say it's de-escalation or deconfliction. It's another cop term. Mm -hmm. And we're working on how to navigate through the deflection process. And that's when an officer comes across somebody that's in the drug world, that's having the issue. How do we get them deflected towards treatment instead of into the criminal justice system? And it's the process is a kind of a combination of both. How do we hold somebody accountable, but get them into a situation where they're eligible for treatment and they want treatment and they're going to work through it. So we're working on committees that are meeting every week. I think it is right now on getting this in place by September 1st so we can get the ball rolling and helping uh, the drug addicted members of the community because that's a whole that's going to help everybody. Um, even the non-drug addicted community members you know, are really going to benefit from this program, we hope. Uh, the downtown volunteer program, I want to speak to that. It's uh, It's been great seeing the downtown volunteers uh, out there. Uh, they're plainly marked, nice and visible. Here, here I am here. Uh, how can I help you type attitudes with the people? And I want to just um, publicly say, as well as most, amongst the committee, if you'd like to participate or know somebody who does, please go on to our department website. There's an apply now box. Click on it, fill in some information um, for your friends, for your family. For your neighbors, whoever you could think of that you think would be a good fit to represent the city in that capacity of helping, not just um, walking around and being seen, but expect to be interacted with, expect people to come up and ask you questions about where you like to eat, where you like to get a drink, but um, also, you know, hey, how can you help me? There's an issue I, I, I found downtown. There's a problem. How can I get in contact with the police? So uh, somebody you know who's comfortable dealing with the public, please refer them to this program. It's been uh, Good success so far. And yeah, you can, yes, yeah, you, can, you can speak to that probably. It's it's a fun opportunity. It's just fun opportunity. It's healthy. You're out there walking in the fresh air. And, and now the weather's good. Fun people. It's even better when the weather's nice. <laughs> <laughs> it was very nice today. Um, a couple of other things I'll touch on. I think the chief wanted me to talk about briefly. Um, I'll just probably go into. We're working with uh, Lane County. Um, and cahoots and crisis response model and updating what the expectation is for that with the new legislative uh, wordings put into place, but how we effectively do that. So I know Jess has been really deeply involved with cahoots and on um, going to meetings with Lane County so we can have a, a good joint way to keep cahoots going, keep a crisis response available, um, which allows our officers to go to the calls they need to be going to, the criminal involved calls as much as possible which probably leads to, and I'll touch on it, but I think you may be bringing it up yourselves, is the, uh, the stats 
Is that part of your packet? Big list of numbers that look like this. Um, I'm happy to talk about it briefly and answer questions about it, but I wanted to, I went through it myself and there's a lot of numbers and a lot of columns, a lot of words. And it's like, how do we make sense of, I've got seven pages at least, seven pages hardly exist, but what does this mean to the police department? We see all these numbers out here. This is a seven week um, snapshot of calls for service by nature and priority. So some of the things that stood out to me that I think are relevant and important. Um, you see things like the number of burglaries, uh, 45 burglaries in a seven week period. Um, we look at those numbers when we see things like that and we are able to refocus our efforts on patrolling certain neighborhoods, certain times of day, looking for certain MOs and certain uh, activities by people we contact at both times of day, whether it's possession of burglar tools, whether it's backpacks, certain behaviors, it helps us focus our patrols to respond to things like that. You'll see calls like criminal trespass, really high number, 300 almost criminal trespass calls. That range is um, going back, touching on briefly what Mary Bridget was talking about with the camping, unhoused, homeless issues. Categorizing and quantifying um, those type of calls are, are difficult because they come in numerous ways. It could be a welfare check, it could be a disorderly conduct, it could be a, um, a trespass call, it could be a dispute call. Folks in that, that are in that realm generate lots of different types of calls. So a lot of the calls I circled in my, in my list here, and from trespassing to disputes, um, those oftentimes involve uh, unhoused people, but a lot of times it's other things too. So we have to go into each call to see what it really involves. But when you have officers going to 300 criminal trespass calls in a seven week period, I think what's important for you to know as a committee is that's time away from going to other calls or being proactive looking for um, any other criminal activity in the city, whether it's drug related, property crime related, or violent crime related. Um, every time an officer or two, because generally those types of calls may generate a two officer response, that's time spent on those calls that aren't spent on other things. So I think it's important for you to see that. Um, same with dispute calls. I, I noticed um, we had 235 dispute calls in a seven week period. Those are generally at least a two officer response. And those can range in you know, a five minute resolution to a 30 minute resolution to an arrest, which could turn into a couple hours depending on going to the jail. So once again, I think it's important for you to see the time spent on those calls is time away from other things that may be important to the community. Uh, incomplete 911 calls you'll see. Um, those are um, a response for us. Every time somebody calls 911 and hangs up, sometimes it's a kid playing with the phone. Sometimes it's an accidental call. Other times it's a dispute. We don't know when those calls comes in what that is. So we have to respond to those to check those out. And they're extremely challenging when they're cell phone calls because more and more people have cell phones instead of landlines now. Usually that landline pins you right to an address. You can go there. Cell phone technology helps us get to a location sometimes. We can have a general area. So we're going to a general area for a dispute or a possible issue. Um, I want to acknowledge the 52 suicidal subject calls that we went to. Um, I think it's it's important to note that our officers are getting more and more training on crisis intervention, people in crisis, and are getting a lot of experience applying that training on a daily basis to suicidal subjects. It's not just cahoots going to those calls. Oftentimes when there's a uh, mention of a weapon, whether it be a gun, a knife or something else, officers are responding to those to make sure it's a safe scene before Cahoots or someone else gets there. Uh, you know, our officers are doing an excellent job at de-escalating those calls for service. Uh, they're honing their skills on identifying people in crisis, people with emotional problems, addiction, and substance abuse problems, and trying to get the resources for them. And I wanted to call attention to the officers to do an excellent job at that. Um, other odds and ends, I'll just touch on the last page of mine. Uh, we see a lot of theft calls. Um, what is theft by deception? It's a, it's a type of theft. Think of uh, phone scams. Think of internet scams. Think of uh, different ways to deceive people into con, conning people for their money. Um, a lot of our theft calls. We are, that's all we've got. What's that? I'm surprised that's all we've got. I am, well, people are getting more and more savvy um, to the scams, the, the phone calls, the emails, 
they're picking up on it. I think when it was a new and novel thing, we had that number was a lot higher, but people are now are not trusting that unknown call mm -hmm. or that suspicious email. They're less trusting of that. They're not falling for it as often. Uh, but we do still have community members, especially the elderly, that do fall into that. Um, it's disappointing we have perpetrators out there committing these offenses. But we do have uh, 217 other theft calls that we go to. A lot of those are retail thefts. Uh, we do have a crime reduction unit right now that is working hand-in-hand -hand with a lot of retail stores in town, everything from Best Buy to Target, Fred Meyer, Jerry's, Walmart. Any business that really says we need some help, we do everything from undercover stings to um, proactive stings where we're parked out there waiting for people to, to run out with the things or the cart full of items. Um, we've done numerous other stings. We're trying to identify not only the thieves that are stealing the merchandise, but those who are receiving it and benefiting from that stolen property. And we're getting really creative how we do that. And we have a really good group of officers right now that are really involved in that. And they, it's fun. It's a fun way to fight crime. It's not driving your car, pulling people over for speeders. To them, it's just uh, it's a, a way to do something a little bit different and catch the offender, hold somebody accountable. Uh, we're all victims of this crime. Whether we're the store owners or not, uh, we pay higher prices when those items get stolen because those merchants need to make their money and pay their bills and pay their employees. So the more proactive we can be about that, I'm really proud about that crime reduction unit, uh, the, what, what they're, the work they're doing right now. And I think... That was the bulk of the uh, business from the police department that I wanted to share, and I took up enough of your time. I'm happy to speak to anything else I can serve you. I have a question, or uh, maybe like a question based on uh, a comment. Um, so uh, one of the th things I heard you kind of allude to is that sometimes when you're on, on some of these calls that... Um, please excuse me if I misunderstood you, but that like where you're off on one thing where you could be doing something else. Um, um, and because what before you even said that when, when I was looking at this um, report uh, before this meeting, I was really curious about the prioritization. Um, and and please excuse my ignorance because I, I have no idea. I, and I, I wouldn't want to be the person trying to decide the priorities on these. Um, but how are these prioritized? Because um, it seems to me that like some of these things, like um, like the dispute, there's um, of the 235, 213 of those are priority threes, which maybe I'm reading this the wrong way, but that seems like a high priority. Um, so um, um, A, am I reading those right? And B, how do you decide, um, who, who decides what the priority is? Um, and then are those kind of double checked later? Yes, a short answer. Um, a dispatcher identifies the priority based on their training experience as well as policy manual and procedure manual that outlines for them, is, is a person at risk? Is there a weapon involved? box checked, maybe that's a, a priority one. Is there allegation of assault that took place with injury? Maybe that knocks it down to a one or a two. Is there a verbal dispute where no one's injured? However, it's getting loud, it's verbal, that may knock it down to a lower priority. Based on the information the dispatcher receives, that priority can change. It can start out as a priority three, but go to a one or vice versa. It could start as a one, but then the suspect that may have the weapon leaves the scene of the dispute that bumps it down to a two or a three or, or lower because we don't have a victim that's actively being threatened or harmed it's triaging it's a lot if anybody's ever been to the er recently you see that charge nurse in the ER, and they're trying to figure out is your head been chopped off or do you have a splinter and everything in between they're trying to figure out who needs to get that er room and if you've been riverbend there's only so many rooms and a lot of people there um we try to do the same thing we evaluate it's a risk assessment, essentially, who's in danger versus who's not in danger and how we can get to those calls. And when I talk about the, you know, the 213 dispute calls that we're on, it means we can't do other things. One of the other things that we identified in the last community survey a couple of years ago that a lot of people wanted to see more of was traffic enforcement of speeding in their neighborhoods, speed racing, loud mufflers, all those, those quality of life issues that if our officers are not on the dispute call, they could actually be doing proactive patrolling, looking for that speeding, looking for the jaywalking, looking for the pedestrian versus vehicle issues that we see in the city. 
So what our officers are on that, that's what I'm talking about. They're not able to do the proactive things that our community wants them to do as much. So more, the less of those calls we go to, the more proactive we can be in, in responding to the things that citizens have expressed a, a concern over in recent surveys. Oh, that makes perfect sense. Now I understand. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, any other questions? All right. Um, so now we have business from the community, or committee, excuse me, and the policy review, which is 61.3.4. Anybody get a chance to read this? And any questions on it? Okay. Sorry to be speaking up again, but... <laughs> The one question I had, um, I was on uh, the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee for the city of Springfield, um, and I rotated out in 2020. Um, and I was just wondering if since then, if the um, police department has created like a liaison with BPAC, um, there wasn't one when I was on it, but I was wondering if that had become a thing or if that was interest, if anybody was interested in making that a thing. I'm not familiar with the police uh liaison to that committee, but I'm open to that idea of making sure that there's a point of contact from someone from that committee, someone at SPD they could reach out to with those concerns and issues that so they have a, a number they can call or a person they can talk to. Okay. When I was on BPAC, uh, Emma was our, the city employee who was, um, uh, so I know she's gone, but she seemed to have like her own contact because she was always like, oh, I was talking to so-and-so over at the police department. And, um, but I know she's gone. And so I don't even know if that's a, the new person has those, those contacts. So I was just something I was thinking about when I was reading this policy. I have to say, actually, Emma and I interacted quite a bit. So I, I, as the staff liaison for SPAC and in addition to some other um, avenues into the police department. She and I would interact a lot. And then from there, depending on what um, was, a, whether it was a project or a BPAC committee initiative, we would route that information to the appropriate resource within the department. So oftentimes committees really will leverage whatever, whoever the staff liaison is at the time um, to, to try to make that connection. And that was just a good example of something that we would do oftentimes because it is related to traffic safety, that that contact would be routed to the traffic team sergeant or um, one of the motor officers to try to um, create some some support. And I, uh, I can't think of a specific example, but there were, there were some initiatives and we would actually kind of try to also leverage some of our community outreach opportunities and just partner there. But I mean, that's been a little bit ago, so I'm not sure. How right, I remember there was a lot of that kind of thing that happened when I was on the committee. And I was just yeah. wondering since since 2020, since I know that I'm no longer on the committee and Emma is gone, if that was still, if, if there was still kind of that coordination happening. Well, we'd definitely be open to it. And unfortunately I can't speak to it. But okay, I, I will, um, I'll reach out to, to Tiffany because yeah. she would be the right person. Okay, thank you. I don't, I just don't, I don't completely understand. I mean, it was my impression on what staff liaisons to committees are the central point of communications and of any issues that the committee has, any committee, and that like what she was mentioning is that that information then would go from her to within the department so that way there's there's a clear path for those types of issues. But was I understanding you that you thought that there would be somebody assigned from the police department to do that specific task? When I was on BPAC, it seemed like a really casual kind of coordination. And after reading this policy, it seemed like something more formalized it felt like to me something more formalized should be in place, but if that was already happening regularly, that seems and and if those staff liaisons, that's part of their role. That's formal. So um, I think that, that, I, that, that is okay. I didn't realize that that was a thing. So that's why I'll, I'll check in with with Tiffany because she would be that then role and and that answered that question. Thank you, Joe. 
example of a follow-up attempt that there was a note that maybe you wanted to discuss it more. So I think Tiffany put it on there. That was the preface she provided to me. So okay. if you don't have an okay well I kind of know what it was about because we're kind of at that point we were kind of not sure what our role was here and how we could get that across to the citizens. Uh, without saying we're part of the police department. I think it was last last meeting last time, we discussed yeah. it yeah. and we had the report then and that was the one that we kind of talked more about of what really what did that mean to us or the community and what we can or can't do to discuss with our community. Yeah. Right. Year, do we go out and say, hey, I'm back, talk to me about what you want and we'll go tell the police that kind of, yeah. is that what we're trying to do or not? I believe that's so, but I don't remember what the follow up was, what it would need to be. Yes, uh, the number two is going forward, SPAC will discuss how to ensure the community is aware of the meetings and so there is opportunity to voice any concerns or questions. Well, and part of it, the, what we had put in the report was that um, we aren't getting any public comments. So, is, is it our role to? help ensure we're getting public comment. Go ask for it. And Joe, you would know the answer to that. <laughs> no, it's, well, I, I, everybody here on the committee is totally welcome to talk to other citizens and ask, you know, if you want to share with some concerns that you have, you may not, you know, some there's part of our population that are fearful of talking with law enforcement directly. And so we're a bridge to those folks that may be more comfortable talking about it. But of course, you got to be very careful because the person started talking about is some sort of criminal act. You're not a report taker right. in regards to that. So that's something where it, if it rises to that level where there's some sort of potential danger to anybody or anything, mm -hmm. that's a different story. But if a person's saying, yeah, my neighborhood is really loud at night, we've got about four or five houses down the street that are constantly being a problem, et cetera. That's something where at the end of the meeting, we all go one by one mm -hmm. saying, well, I'm hearing that down on this street that we're hearing, we're getting a lot of noise complaints and people are really upset about it. And then George will sit over there and going, oh, really? Okay. And he's going to scratch that down and then he's going to notify it and he'll maybe even ask, what does there anybody know what hours that's normally happening? He can narrow that down, share that with patrol and patrol can put in an extra patrol request is what they're called to that neighborhood to help maybe mitigate that. So we can be the mouthpiece for citizens that, that come to us, but they got to know that you're sitting on this committee. And so you have to, to get out of your box a little bit and talk to folks and say, hey, if you, if you hear of anybody that's got concerns, whatnot, there's a, there's a committee that does that and or better yet, invite them to come here during these times and say, <clears throat> because, because there's a public meeting, it's also have an opportunity for the public to speak. And so you can ask them, come on to this committee. It's a very low key. Um, and what's your concern? And, and there's people here that listen. There's both citizens and the police representatives here. Mm -hmm. So our role really is to, to try to get information. Not, that didn't sound right. Try to, to be a, an earpiece for the public to share with the police and be a, a liaison to the public or the community. And that's what they depend upon the community members to be is, is we represent the public and the community, and we should be trying to represent what the community is saying and voice that to the PD. That's that's the core, in my 
humble opinion and my lack of experience is that is that is the core purpose for most committees right. is is to to share the thoughts of the community to the staff so they can share that up the chain of command so to speak or even it may become a council issue that's that's the real purpose that's nice your force multiplier for city council i think some people would go to their counselors over issues they want to know about but in the absence of knowing who their counselor is or reaching out to them you are that extra yeah. multiplier for council because you report to council about the issues also so yeah. i think you're in a really important role to be that liaison for us as well as council and things that come up here my job sitting here is also to share with my fellow counselors things that kind of say well you know maybe we need to because i'm part of the council leadership and so it may be something where i'm going to say you know what i'm going to make this an agenda item so when i meet with the mayor tomorrow and with the county uh, the city manager assistant city manager and the city attorney and say this seems to be an issue i want this up on the agenda and i want someone to talk about it to the council so it, it that's our job yeah. i think it might be helpful though if the department helps spread that awareness themselves like they can like notify the community i would think that like this committee exists because like sure. people i know don't have any idea about this community or this um committee and so like i'm i don't know if the department ever advertises or shares that information regularly but on the website as well on social media especially yeah, okay. when there's um seats available yeah. um it's facebook instagram and twitter are all reposted and retweeted during that process i, I see but, the positions open but i don't really see like what is it you know that's what I'm kind of like. Maybe we could like share like some examples or something like of what we talk about here, maybe or something or an invitation for people or I don't know. Okay. Is there a description of the committee's purpose on the city's website? I mean, the full list. Of I think it's I think it's on the city's website. It's through oh, the council so the council's page. Finding it on there, I believe. Yeah, yeah. More information is always good. To what you to your point is sharing, but what it is yeah. really happens. Mm -hmm. I share when, when the city or PD puts out something or I see something from the city, I'm, I'm a member of a, a Facebook page, I've got 4,000 members, and I I always put stuff on, I think you may have done it, but I put stuff out all the time uh, that is relevant, and, it, and I never realized in my tenure how important social media yeah. would become, yeah. but it's crazy important right now, especially mm -hmm. when we're talking about okay, People are really upset because the street, the street is getting torn up in front of Thurston as a subs project that is that that is disrupting classes in school when they could wait till next week when school's completely out. So that's that's an issue that I share. And you know, so it's it's I think it's I, I'm pretty proud of how well the city's communication with the citizens have, has gone this last five, six years, seven years. It's been really good. And other agencies with Lima Lane and the school district, it's been a pretty phenomenal ship. So we keep, we have to keep it going. Mm -hmm. The city is tired of new PIO. Yes. Yeah, I had a chance to meet her at the Veterans Day ceremony last week. Or, well, last right. Week. But, um, so that was exciting. But does the police department have their own mm -hmm. internal? We have a public information coordinator, so he's he generally Zach. that's Zach. Yeah. He's generally not the on-camera person, but he's the coordinates behind the scenes with social media posts, press releases, works with our staff on communications. Um, do you get communications from him? Yeah, 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 yeah we do. Okay. Yeah. I do too. So and the fire department just hired, or is hiring, or just hired? Did they just hire? They're hiring. 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 I mean. Just got approved to hire their first PIO. And the fire department is a huge department, and they've not, they have not had a PIO, really? so we just approved funding for that, and so that you'll start to see more stuff coming from the fire department in that on that side of thing of, of public safety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Embarrassingly, I'm not sure how long this has been at the bottom of our minutes. Just noticing kind of the mission statement of the committee's purpose, and just wondering, you know, from the city's roles, PIO roles engagement roles and reaching out to you know, those groups within the community as part of just general outreach and updates and, and just you know, sharing that awareness that we do have a committee for this purpose. This is when they need more information is available on the website and that can be on the It's on the top of the new agenda each week. I know when I read that I was like wait I seen that Okay. Um, 
anybody have anything to share? Um, I I am a little remiss. I uh, believe we have a new member to our little group. Like to introduce yourself. Oh, you missed that earlier. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I apologize for missing. No, you're fine. Good afternoon. I was more of a fly on the wall this evening. I uh, plan to be there in person next time. So uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Josh Aguilar. Um, lived in Springfield for a very long time. Moved from Los Angeles. Uh, but this is home for me. Went to uh, high school, uh, college, graduate school here in, uh, in Lane County. So uh, thanks for having me, everybody. Oh, Anybody else have anything? I'm going to call the meeting at 7.06. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.